Hello once again everybody and welcome back to Realms Remembered. This is Michael T. Bradley. We are again going to do some <laughs> house cleaning here. Seems like that's all we're doing lately, but it's it's somewhat necessary. Just wanted to explain, I know that last time I was like, hey, I'll be back really soon talking about some trilogies. Well, the next day I got this pretty, it wasn't horrible, but I got a, a decently bad cold that kind of took my voice for a couple of weeks. And then when I got it back, it was like my voice was nothing but... Uh, hacking and blowing my nose and blah 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 so it really wasn't pleasant you can probably still hear a bit of a nasal pitch if you happen to have a good ear beyond that what with the move the new job blah 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 it's just a little bit difficult to get things together but i've been doing a decent amount of reading and uh that's what we're all here for right this session we're going to kind of go through actually a lot of stuff that I'm skipping and uh, setting down a somewhat firm new law here. Well, not law, I'm not empowered to make laws, but a new rule here on Realms Remembered, which is if I don't really enjoy a book, I'm just going to skip it. I mean, I I've been kind of going through here and even the ones that I don't really like, I'll force myself through, but... I don't know, I'll, I'll talk about the kind of breaking point here uh, when we get to it, but there just seem to be a lot of these that I'm giving way too much of a chance and just kind of skimming through and not even really paying much attention to, but just, yeah, 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 maybe this will lead somewhere, and it rarely ever does. So let's see. Let's let's go through here. Uh, I'm I'm going to leave the, the Empire's Trilogy, Horse Lords is the first book of that, t till the end, because it's actually the one out of here that I read. Um, the rest of them, mostly I skipped. So, uh, Daughter of the Drow, uh, Tangled Webs, and Windwalker. I might have those out of order, but that's a trilogy. That's the, um, oh god, what is it? Songs and Starlight trilogy? Something like that. By Elaine Cunningham. This just, wow. Like, I went ahead and tried it. I, I went, I, I was like, you know, why not? I'll give it a shot. And holy crap, was it, 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 it it's Menza Baranzen again like Gromfs there, blah, 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 and it really just felt like, hey kids, do you like Drizzt? What if Drizzt had tits? Wouldn't that be cool too? Here's a trilogy. Because it's essentially, it's a, one of the, um, oh god, what is she, a Baneret? I, I don't even know. I, I so did not care. I got like two chapters in, maybe not even that, and I was just done, because it's more Menza Barons and bullshit, and who cares, right? I don't. I, I can't see how anybody does, but it, they just keep pumping this crap out as if we really want to read about it. I think part of this also is because uh, there's a six-year skip in the Drizzt books here, and I'm assuming that's because in real time Salvatore was writing the Cleric Quintet. I, I haven't actually checked the dates on it, but I'm going to guess that since the Cleric Quintet falls within the six years that we're skipping in the life of Drizzt, that probably he actually wrote those in real time in those five, six years. So they just made it so that um, uh, six years passed in the realms to go along with that. And I'm guessing that they were like, well, crap, we got to have some stuff with Dark Elves. We have to keep that, like, property alive or whatever. So they were like, hey, Elaine, you'll do anything we ask, right? Here, write this trash. I mean, I'm sorry. I, I really, really try to, like, approach these from a professional standpoint, not just knock them and, and say that they're pumped out for a dollar, but that's really what this feels like. This feels like the most shameful exploitative thing that we've had in a long while. Um, I, as much as I liked them, I would say that the uh, Curse of the Azure Bond, stuff like that, the, the video game tie-in is probably also pretty exploitative. But yeah, this just felt horrible. I could not get through it at all. What a terrible terrible thing. Also, Elaine Cunningham wrote Elf Shadow. Uh, that whole trilogy, by the way, takes place in 1361. Elf Shadow also takes place in 1361, and wow, could I not get through that. It was, um, I stuck with it for like four or five chapters, and it was, uh, almost the, the straw that broke the camel's back when it comes to, uh, me just kind of slogging through books and hoping that they'll get better. Yeah, I stuck with it longer than I really should have. It's just, I don't know, I just find it kind of dull. The main character is very, very, like, fantasy trope ridden. She's, I mean, imagine some sort of mix of uh, Drizzt and um, Bella from Twilight, and you, you're kind of on the right track there. A little bit of Harry Potter thrown in, because I think she's an orphan, which I guess, technically at this point, Drizzt is an orphan too. I don't know, I, I, I don't know if his whole family's dead, but he's, he's not of his family anymore, so I think it counts. Yeah, I, I, I just didn't dig it. It just didn't feel 
it felt clumsy. And I don't know if that was Elaine Cunningham's first novel or if she had done many other things. It might have been her first Realms novel, if nothing else, and maybe she was just having a hard time with it. I don't know, but it felt clumsy. For those of you uh, Elaine Cunningham fans out there who think that I'm just totally knocking her, I do want you to know that uh, I've started Elf Song. We're not going to go into it. Elf Song, the sequel to Elf Shadow. And I, I like to give sequels a chance, even if I didn't like the first one, unless it's like a specific trilogy. But this one has like five or six parts, and they seemed distinctly different enough that I went ahead and gave it a shot. And I'm really liking it. I'm really liking Elf Song. We'll see if that stays through the whole thing. I'm about 24%, I think, through it right now. So about a quarter of the way through, but I'm really digging it and enjoying it uh, so much more. And part of the reason is because Erilyn, or whatever the hell her name is, is basically written out in like two pages and she works so much better as like the lost love who was so awesome and blah 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 rather than the lost love who's really awesome and on the page. So there you go. Really digging Elf Song, but Elf Shadow I just did not care for. So I mentioned the Cleric Quintet. Let's talk about that. I tried reading it years ago, back when that giant omnibus first came out, either from the Sci-Fi Book Club or... I think they did it first, and then TSR or Wizards or whoever actually came out with their own a couple of years later. Anyway, I tried reading it uh, in that form, and I was digging it for about the first half of the first book, and then I was like, wait, I've seen The Naked Now. I mean, it's a great Star Trek episode, but... I don't feel anything for these characters and don't know them well enough to do that story with them. If you want to get really picky, I think The Naked Now was done so early on in the original Star Trek series that it probably could, you could probably say the same for it then, but since those characters are now so iconic, at the time that I watched it, I did know a lot about Kirk and Spock, so it really, really meant a lot more. But who would get picky when we're nitpicking through 30 or whatever years of, uh, of uh, genre fiction, right? That's just a silly thing to do. So that's what stopped me from reading it. Uh, a friend of mine, Jason, from the other stuff on this channel, did read it and said that he enjoyed it up to the point when Catterley gets like a magic staff or something like that, a rod, a staff, a, a something of that nature, and suddenly he becomes the most powerful being ever. Like, essentially, he just has godlike powers and no problem is surmountable. I don't know, Salvatore really likes those characters. I mean, can you imagine Drizzt getting in a fight he can't win at this point? I sure can't. That's just the type of stuff that Salvatore likes to write about. I mean, Salvatore does it, uh, supposedly. Greenwood does it, having never been able to make it through any of his stuff. I don't know. But supposedly a lot of his stuff has to do with kind of the higher power things. You know, and, and that just doesn't really interest me much. I don't know. Maybe it's just me. Whatever. So that's as far as I made it into the Cleric Quintet. Not saying it's bad, just not for me. Be curious to see if anybody really liked it and why. I don't even remember the characters, really. I remember Catterley's the main cleric. Uh, I think Pickle's in that. Whatever. We've also got the Mastica trilogy in here, which I'm mostly skipping because of my issues with the Empire trilogy, which we'll get into in a second. But first, I'll go ahead and cover Red Magic by Gene Robb. Rabe, however you say that. This was the book that broke me. I, I just, I started reading this and I so wanted to like it because it's about the Red Wizards of Thay and I find them so interesting and so intriguing and I want to know more about them and it's just poorly written. It is so overwritten and so, there, there are just sections that are really unnecessary and it's like the Harper inclusion feels forced and I, I'm sure they play a bigger part in the rest of the book and it all makes sense as to why they're there. But I'm like, why can't we just have an interesting Red Wizard and read about them? Whisper of Waves does it. I really enjoyed the uh, Red Wizard in that. I, it, it's like it's like when people write evil, quote-unquote, characters, they just can't help making them annoying. Uh, you don't have to do that. You can make an interesting evil character, but... Oh, so yeah, I was forcing myself through it because I'm like, I really want to know more about Thay, and I just got to a point and I'm like, why am I doing this? This should be enjoyable. This should be fun. This should be interesting. It's not. So I dropped that decently quickly, and I, I just decided I'm going to skip stuff if I don't care. I mean, I know I've been skipping around, obviously, but I'm, I'm going to be a little bit harsher of a critic at this point because I think your time and my time demand that. Okay, so let's talk about the Empire's Trilogy. First one is Horse Lords. This is mostly about the, uh, oh god, what are they called? Well, they're called the Horse Lords, and they, they live on the steppes or whatever. And it's, uh, you know, uh, Mongols. They, they, they're they equivalent to Mongols. 
And here's the problem. Like, everything that I read about this and everything that I, uh, everything that I saw, it just really, really feels like this is the Mongols breaking the Wall of China, the Great Wall of China. And it just, I don't know, it felt like it borrowed from history so much that I was like, I think I would just rather read an historical fiction novel. Like, people have said that it's very similar to Shogun. I'm like, I'd just rather read Shogun at this point. I mean, this isn't interesting because I don't know enough about this actual period of real history to know what they're pulling from and what they're making up, and it just doesn't uh, hook me. It wasn't badly written, and the first of the trilogy is actually my favorite because I found the Mongols and their way of life uh, intriguing. I mean, it was fun seeing this kind of fish out of water, because it's mostly about a shoe who gets kind of shanghaied, forgive the pun, um, into being a member of their tribe, or however you want to put it. Being a member of, like, Genghis or whatever, I guess, tribe. I, I can't remember any of the names at this point. Um, I read this quite a while ago. And, and so seeing him, like, kind of having to adapt to things and trying to figure out ways around, like, his generals and everything was pretty interesting. My main problem with it was the fact that he's Shu, and not until about three-quarters of the way through the book did I finally pick up that the Shu were the Chinese. He just felt way too much like he was, say, a Cormirian. And I'm like, why not just make him a Cormirian? And I thought that even more, especially when I read the second book. So here's the problem. I, I liked the first book decently. Horse Lords, I thought, was interesting, fun enough, and, and I was uh, pulled into it. Then we get into Dragon Wall, which it's odd that it's named that since the Dragon Wall gets destroyed at the end of the first book, but whatever. We get into Dragon Wall, and it's all about the shoe, and it's basically about the shoe reacting to the stuff that happened in the first book. And I'm just skimming it like, you know, maybe a book on the shoe would be interesting, but I'm more interested in these guys, the uh, the Genghis and his group. I, I wanted to know what happened to that. They finally show up about 86% of the way through the book as actual characters, and there till the end is amazing. And you know what? The whole, like, main character of book two, like, his breaking away from the shoe and joining Genghis and them, I skimmed and mostly skipped all of that backstory, and I still didn't feel like I was missing anything. It was still powerful and awesome and totally worked for me. So, skip to about the last 30 or 40 pages, and it's really, really good. And read the whole thing if you want to know lots about how the Shu dynasty or dynasty or however, whatever, works. But if, if you don't want to know that, and if you just feel kind of tired of them doing historical fiction, but with enough fiction that it you had no idea, then don't read it. Um, if you know a lot about Chinese culture, it might be fun to see what they pick from and what they don't. Then third one, Empires, is very, very frustrating, or sorry, Crusade, <laughs> third of the Empires, Crusade, is very, very frustrating because on one hand, it's kind of interesting to see a different side of Azun and Bengardast, Bengardahast, however the hell you say that. On the other side, everything about it is really dull, really boring, until the last 20 or so percent, much like book two, because it's like, well, I don't care about all of this. I want to see how it ends. The kind of strange thing is, in a lot of ways, it plays like a prequel to Horse Lords, because Horse Lords is all about Genghis after he's united the tribes and doing this stuff with the tribes. Whereas Crusade is all about Azun attempting to unite the tribes so that they can fight these guys. A lot of political wrangling with Cormir, which I gotta say, like, I, I like the idea. I found the bits that uh, were from the point of view of, uh, what was his name, like Fletcher John or something, Black John, Razor John, some horse shit like that. I found those tiresome and a bit overdone. Did not care for those bits. Also, I hate Azun and Vangardahast, so that's a big block for me to get past. But if you like that, then this is a really good book, and if you're interested in seeing a lot more like political wrangling than even, I would say, Cormier a novel, this is a good book. Didn't really work for me for the reasons I've set out, but it, it, wasn't, it wasn't horrible uh, in, uh, in its scope. All right, so that's it for now. Thank you for joining me, and I hope you return to Realms Remembered.